Okay, so let's start with this curve. Um, you've seen this before, right? So maybe explain to me again what, what does it show? What's the idea here? Because this you have to know for the exam anyway, so we may as well try in this now. <laughs> this is one of the most popular slides overall. And unfortunately, only three people, so there's going to be more of this where I ask you, which <laughs> you now have to deal with. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want. <laughs> so just start whoever wants to, I mean. Okay, where do we start? So the blue area, I remember there are the, the proteins with the same structure. True. So above the black curve, um, or, or we can see that with increasing number of residues aligned, you need less and less percentage of sequence identity to, to have similar structure between the proteins. Yes, so what is the, we essentially said it, if we have aligned residues, so the basis for this whole thing is that you align two proteins, first of all, right? Yes. And then you have a length of that alignment and you know how much sequence identity you have in this alignment. Um, yeah, and then the rest you just already explained. Um, you have this curve, and um, this um, curve is empirically determined from a set of, of, of structures, from a set of structure pairs, um, where we know they have a similar structure, and um, then they just fit the curve so that um, proteins that have a similar structure are above this curve. So um, the idea is that that any two, any alignment where the where the, the point falls above the curve we uh, are really sure that they have a similar structure and as they have a similar structure we also assume they have a similar function. They may also have a similar structure and function down here but here it's harder to tell because the um, sequence identity is so low that we don't know. So there are some below as well but um, for the ones that are above we are sure that they are definitely similar. That's um, the basic idea here. And I'm showing this now in the context of variant effect prediction because if we look, for example, I actually do want to use this. Here at for 100 residues aligned, we have like, uh, let's say, 33%, I believe, sequence identity is our cutoff, where we um, are exactly at the curve. And um, that essentially means, uh, if you turn it around, that 67% of uh, those residues still differ. So you could argue that, um, you know, if we, if we have a sequence variant, um, probably it's not that important, right? Because if these are 67% different and um, there is no effect on the, on the function, it's still a similar function, um, it can't be that important, right? Is, that, um, is there anything that you could argue against this? The, I mean, <laughs> the, I put it uh, as a convincing argument, I guess, but um, there is one thing that has to be noted here. What about definitely most most changes don't matter is what you could argue, right? Because 67 percent, that's a, a big part of the sequence. Um, I'm talking about the region where the sequence identity is 100 percent. But we don't know if um, the sequence identity implies structural similarity, so we don't know which one is structural to one. Um, that's not really related to what I'm getting at, no. but no, this is, so that point, just to reiterate maybe here, the thing is the alignment is so small that um, just by statistics you are very likely to find such an alignment. So you can't really say if this means anything. So we have like, what, 20 residues aligned, and finding 20 aligned residues is not that hard. So we can't really say anything there. Um, no, the point I was getting at is that um, the, the argument I'm making is a bit biased, because um, these 67% are not representative of typical changes you find in the population, because these 67% here are exactly those which don't matter. Right, because this is exactly where we put the curve. Evolution has um, determined which residues apparently are important and which ones aren't, and um, exactly those 67% which make the difference between the two proteins 
um, are the 67% that don't matter for the structure. But that is not how a variant usually would be distributed if, if you just look at all variants that occur. Um, because they may as well hit the other 33% um, uh, of, of the more important residues. So um, it's, not, it's not like the... So you can't really say that most of the changes don't matter um, just from this curve. And when we develop methods that to pre predict the effect of variants, that's exactly what we want them to determine. We want them to find which of the variants are the ones that actually matter. And this is um, really hard to do if so many don't actually have an effect. Okay, so before we get into different methods to predict um, variant effect, let's just define some baselines again. Um, you've probably all heard this before already, uh, maybe even Burkhardt mentioned it, but um, just to reiterate then, <coughs> uh, there are different types of variations uh, on the sequence and um, we can look at this at the level of the DNA and RNA first of all. Here the most simple thing we could have is uh, substitution. I hope you can still read this, the font is a bit small. But um, yeah, the most simple thing would be substitution. So we have four bases and one base changes to a different base, a single nucleotide change. Um, yeah, for example, adenine to cytosine or anything like that. Um, then we have insertions and deletions. So um, at some point in the sequence you add one or more nucleotides or you um, cut them out. Uh, also changing the length of that sequence. And then there's this um, notion of indels, which kind of depends on, on uh, who you're talking to, I guess. So that could just be insertions and deletions in a short, quick name. Or it could actually mean an event where you have an insertion and deletion at the same time. So um, this kind of depends, but um, yeah, so you, you, can't, um, you can't really know without any context, but um, the idea is the same, insertion, yeah, insertion and deletion. What's the difference to a substitution? Multiple changes. A substitution is really just one nucleotide change. And so that, first of all, that doesn't change the length, right? So it just substitutes one for the other. And then also it's just one change. While insertion can be addition of, so even if it's just one, even if you had just one nucleotide, you're still changing the sequence, right? Yeah. And um, you not only are you changing the sequence, if you are in an exon, if you are in a coding region, then adding one also means that you are shifting the, the reading frame. So always uh, three nucleotides code for one amino acid, and then if you add just one, the whole thing gets shifted one to the right, and that probably messes up your reading frame completely. If you add three, maybe it's not so bad, because then you don't change that. And the same thing for deletions. This is just multiple nucleotides changing. Uh, and not just changing in terms of substitution, but being removed or added. Um, then you have duplications. Uh, which I guess you could see as a form of insertion. So here you have something that is already there and then you just duplicate the same thing again before that or behind that. Um, so say for example three nucleotides um, which are then just repeated. Um, <clears throat> and then inversions are um, an effect of how, uh, of how, how DNA is uh, replicated for example. Um, and what this does is if you have the sequence here, for example, and you have here CTGA, then the inversion of that is the reverse complement. So um, not only do you, do you, build the you use the complementary basis, you also have to start reading from the back, so to say. So um, the reverse of A is T, and the reverse of G is C, and so on. So this is T, C, A, G, which you then have here, right? So that's an inversion. Um, yeah, but I mean, th this won't be relevant for, for the methods we're going to look at, but just to give you an idea of what else, is, what else happens. Um, on the DNA and RNA level, uh, if we look at proteins now, how so these changes um, appear on, on nucleotides, if, if we now translate um, to the proteins, what, um, what do these changes now look like? Uh, Substitutions can now be um, missense or also non-synonymous, so that means we change nucleotides in a way um, 
or we, we change that one nucleotide in a way that it changes the amino acid that it uh, translates to. So um, uh, usually if, if you have a code on the third base, for example, is relatively, uh, it's called wobble base because it's not that important. So in the genetic code, usually changing that last base doesn't really change the amino acid. Not always, but often. Um, while if you change the other two often, that leads to a different amino acid. So that would be a missense mutation. Um, if you have the other case that you don't change the amino acid, that is called a silent mutation, also a synonymous variant or SNP. Um, and then finally you have nonsense uh, variants, which uh, is that you change a codon such that you introduce a stop codon at a point where it usually doesn't occur. So um, you have three codons which code for stop codons, and if you change um, the nucleotides in a way that you create this, then during the translation, the, the machinery is just going to stop early and your protein is uh, going to be truncated and probably not going to function anymore. Uh, hence, nonsense. So if you have just half the protein, usually that doesn't work too well. Um, yeah, and then again, you can have these insertions, deletions, and duplications. That's the same idea as on the DNA level. You just uh, gain or remove some amino acids. Um, and inversions on the level of proteins is not really, not really uh, a common notion because uh, if, if you have an inversion on the DNA level, that does not translate to what you would believe would be an inversion on the protein level or anything like that. So if, if this is your DNA sequence, these two codons code for um, these two amino acids. And then if you invert them, they, con they, of course, code for some completely different amino acids. So on the protein level, this doesn't really make sense. Um, so you don't, you don't have that. Just if you're wondering why that is missing from the list. OK. Um, <clears throat> again, just uh, on the name of things, um, there is such a standardization committee, I guess, the sequence variant nomenclature which defines how you should ideally call your variants uh, or name them in papers and everywhere so that um, it's easy to identify what you're talking about. Um, it can be really messy and they are trying to to put some structure into this but um, if you ever parse uh, a database you will realize that it still is um, usually <laughs> Not that well defined how people refer to their variants. Um, there is uh, the difference between single nucleotide variants and single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, traditionally, that is a difference. So, a polymorphism implies that this variant you're talking about, or that it's a position where you have multiple variants and they all occur in the population uh, at a frequency of at least 1% or more. So then you, would, then you would call that a single nucleotide polymorphism at that position. Nowadays, usually, uh, people don't really make a difference here, and polymorphism and variant are used interchangeably. Um, and that is also what Burkhardt always does, as far as I know. Um, but in, yeah, just so you know, technically, that's the difference here. Uh, if someone just says mutation, so I'm also doing this a lot, I guess that can mean anything. So. <laughs> So for some people that means it's a, it's a change that causes a disease, but it could also just be a general change, it could just be a variant. Um, this is not at all a well-defined uh, vocabulary. Uh, then there's single amino acid variants, which would essentially be a missense uh, mutation, a missense variant, or a non-synonymous SNP or SNV, for example. So something that changes an amino acid, uh, sometimes called SAV to make that more clear. Um, and then finally, there's the idea of 19 non-native. We will get, to get back to this later. And um, the idea here is that you have a position in the sequence. You have a certain amino acid there. And uh, 19 non-native are, are the variants to all other 19 amino acids. So uh, if you have 20 to choose from, um, there is uh, 19 possible variants that could occur at one position. So that's what we mean if we say 19 non-native. And 19 non-native is in contrast to SNV possible or SNP possible. Um, so 
just from the name, do you have any idea what that could mean then? If 99 native is mutating to all other 19, what, is, what could SNV possible be? Maybe, why and why would that be? Because it's quite the opposite of being able to uh, <laughs> Oh, I see. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and sometimes that may be true, but there is a biological reasoning for saying we cannot mutate to all 19. Uh, well, um, certain amino acids have similar uh, chemical properties. Yes. So that is um, why you can exchange them sometimes and mm -hmm. the same function. Structure. That's a good point, yes, you could argue for that. So, for example, a negatively charged amino acid should not be uh, substituted by a positively charged one or hydrophobic one, yeah. because that is going to severely change um, the biochemical properties. True, that's a fair interpretation, but not what I'm getting at, unfortunately. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, it's, yeah. I have not understood, understood quite well what the 19 non native means. So, okay. I, have a, I have a sequence and I just substitute a certain amino acid with anything else but this itself. Yeah. So say so first position in the sequence you have a methionine usually. That means you can mutate that methionine to end to all of the other nineteen amino acids. So there is the chance that I get nonsense. No, because nonsense is not an amino acid, right? Yeah. But you're kind of going in the right direction. I could get a stop codon. If you do what? I need the right, the right amino acid sequence for that. Is it three? Uh, well, not amino acid sequence, but right codon, you mean. Yeah. So uh, there is no amino acid for stop because it no. is not translated. The amino acids, I believe, to make a stop codon. The, the three nucleotides, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> an important difference. So on the, uh, the DNA is composed of nucleotides. Three I'm nucleotides are one codon. One codon is one amino acid, right? Yeah. But you're, you're getting to the right point. So we are saying it's a single nucleotide variant or single nucleotide polymorphism. So we can make only one change. So um, if, if we take this literally, right? So then uh, SNB possible is anything that we can reach in really just one change. We cannot go, if we have a certain codon that codes for an amino acid, we cannot go to every other amino acid in just one change. Um, and that is what 19 and native kind of implies. But SNB possible is only doing those, um, only substituting by those that we can reach in one nucleotide change. So uh, that's the genetic code. <coughs> and for example, if we look at UGG, which codes for tryptophan here, um, we can make, uh, what can we do? We want to go to phenylalanine up here. This is coded by UUU or UUC. And we have UGG, and you can see that we have to change these two nucleotides, the last two nucleotides, to get to phenylalanine. So this is not an SNV possible change. If we have tryptophan, we cannot go in just one SNP to phenylalanine. However, to um, serine, for example, here, UCG, we can go by just changing the middle nucleotide. So that's the idea of, of uh, SNV or SNP possible. Um, yeah. OK, uh, just some interesting examples of the effect that variants can have, um, maybe just so we know why we actually care about this. Um, we talked about different types of variants and now I'm going to give you uh, four different examples of what, the, what can, what they could lead to. Um, so the first one is um, sickle cell anemia. I'm not, has any of you heard of that before maybe? It's a relatively popular example I believe. Um, what we have here is just one uh, non-synonymous SNP, so a single nucleotide change, exactly what we just talked about. And um, it has relatively drastic effects. So this happens in the hemoglobin subunit. Um, beta hemoglobin, the uh, molecule we're interested in here is hemoglobin A that has four subunits, two are alpha, two are beta. And in the beta subunit is this one change. And um, the, what this leads to is um, 
that as soon as uh, hemoglobin uh, releases oxygen, it, it denatures because of this uh, one amino acid, the structure changes, the protein denatures and in turn then aggregates. And um, the protein aggregating then in turn leads to the whole red blood cell which contains the hemoglobin changing its shape. So usually these kind of look like this, like a plate with a dimple in it or something like that. Um, but if the hemoglobin in there aggregates, it builds these, these fibers here inside and that leads to the, the whole cell um, becoming unstable first of all and being destroyed much earlier than it would usually but also just changing its shape to this sickle-like shape. And that in turn um, has issues because for example as you can see here they, they then tend to clump together and clog up, uh, clog up arteries and that's not very healthy. Um, the interesting thing about this is, so this doesn't sound very good, right? You would expect that this kind of mutation would be um, weeded out by evolution at some point uh, because there is no, no advantage to it really, it's just bad. Mm. One of the reasons it's still around <coughs> is that um, this change and this uh, so if, if you have both copies of this gene are, um, are affected, then there is no, there is nothing, then you have this issue and then this is a problem. But if you have just one copy of it um, defective and one not, if you are heterozygote, then you don't really have the negative effects. So um, some, some of the cells may not be formed normally, but it's still fine. So unless you go at really high altitude or something where you are deprived of oxygen, where you really need um, all of the red blood cells to work well for you, um, you're probably going to be fine. Um, and on top of that, actually this, this change of the hemoglobin uh, happens to give you a very uh, well, not immunity, but a very much decreased risk to, to get malaria. So if you live in a region where malaria is um, commonplace, then having one defective copy of this gene is actually good for you. And this gives you a selective advantage. And that's why um, there are tons of heterozygotes in Africa, for example, and uh, of course then if they have kids, it could be that, there is, uh, that, uh, that um, the, the child becomes a homozygote and then has the disease. But as long as the heterozygotes have this advantage, there is no real evolutionary pressure for this allele to ever disappear from the population. Uh, yeah. Uh, why is the risk of malaria increased? Yes, um, I don't know unfortunately. I believe it's the way some molecule binds on the surface and it doesn't work anymore, but I'm not, I don't know, unfortunately. But I'm sure, like, this should, this should be easy to find out if, maybe I can do it afterwards if we have time. Um, yeah, something of how, how the, um, how it binds to the cells then doesn't work anymore. Maybe it's, maybe it is the shape that it kind of makes it harder to bind to something like that. Um, Okay, so that is a non-synonymous SNP, relatively straightforward that a change, that an actual amino acid change may have an effect. Um, we also talked about synonymous SNPs, so um, a nucleotide change that doesn't change the amino acid, so the protein looks the same afterwards. You could argue then why would this ever have an effect, right? It doesn't change the protein, but it does have an effect. Why or how? How could, uh, how could a change just on the DNA still, affect, still have some kind of effect uh, on, on the protein or on the organism? If you have another mutation in the DNA, it gets different uh, protein. <laughs> True, it kind of changes what SNP possible becomes, I guess. Yes, that's an interesting point. But even if that doesn't happen, even if we have just this one change, For example, think about, we just saw this genetic code, right? 
So 64 different um, codons which code for different amino acids and it's redundant because we only have 20 amino acids but we have 64 different combinations. Um, so some codons code for the same amino acid. That's why we can have these silent mutations. Um, that doesn't mean that the codons are equal. So uh, the way this works is that on the during translation, the tRNA has the anti-codon for the codon. So if you have a certain codon on the DNA, <coughs> you need a tRNA that, that uh, carries the, the fitting amino acid for that codon. That's how translation works. You, you recruit the tRNA that has the amino acid for your codon. Now, for some amino acids, you, maybe we, we can back here. Um, for leucine, for example, you have six different codons. Um, and that means six different tRNAs, because there is only one exact match for every codon. Six different tRNAs, all of them carry leucine. But that doesn't mean that you have the same amount of the six different tRNAs. So some of these codons may be much more common in the, in the cell than other codons. And that means if you use a codon for which you don't have uh, a lot of tRNA, for example, then you can affect how fast translation happens, for example. Or if it happens at all, maybe, if the, if the codon is, is um, just really depleted right now in the cell. So you can think of it as a resource, as if there is no resource anymore, the protein production is just... Uh, yes. Maybe. Yes, sure. Well, I mean, I'm not, yeah, so, and, and you don't even have to go through that extreme. Just the speed is actually important um, because a protein, while it is being translated, the end appears out of the ribosome. And that, that threat of protein that is being translated as it comes out may already start folding. And for some proteins where this happens, it's important how fast it comes out of the ribosome. Because it ha th this is how it developed, that it folds already while it is appearing. And then if you stall here, if you, if you slow down the translation speed and efficiency, then it may not fold anymore, for example. So that is one way in which just changing a nucleotide can still affect the protein. And I listed a few more here. Um, but let's first look at the example. So that's the, the other possibility is splice sites. So um, this is a relatively arbitrary example from Cruzon syndrome. Um, what we have here is uh, a fibroblast uh, growth factor receptor 2. And here is our variant. So GCG we change to GCA. Both of these codons code for the same amino acid. So that doesn't change anything. But usually this is our exon. It goes from, like it starts somewhere here, it goes along until here, and then this is the splice site. So here we have an intron which is cut out, and then here is the next exon. So from here until here is where our protein usually goes. And the splice sites are being recognized here by this AGGT, that's the 5 prime splice site, that's what the machinery for splicing recognizes here. And then AGCG here is the, the 3 prime splice site. So the, the splicing machinery recognizes these two motifs and cuts out what's in between because we don't want the intron as part of the protein. Now, if we change, whoops, sorry, if we change GCG to GCA, then what we created here is AGGT which looks a lot like AGGT over here. So if then the splice machinery comes along, it thinks that this is the 5 prime splice site. And then it actually cuts out this part, which is supposed to be part of the exon. So we are truncating our exon, truncating our protein, and in this case, damaging the protein in this case. Um, so here is, again, this is exactly what I just explained. Um, if you do this change, you go from position 334 to 362. You just lack the part in between because that's what you cut out. Well, usually you have all of these positions in between. That's the idea. Um, yeah, so we have supply side changes. We have uh, things that um, affect the translation speed, the translation uh, fidelity. Then there is the whole topic of the RNA. Um, we don't directly go from DNA to protein. We first have to create the messenger RNA. Um, and the RNA has a structure, actually. 
So it's not just um, floating around in one string, it does build secondary structure, it builds loops and things like that. And these loops can be important because um, that structure kind of uh, confers a certain stability. And if the RNA is less stable, it may be degraded faster, you may get less of the protein, or maybe if you're um, if the, the translation start site is, becomes less stable, it, you may not be able to translate it anymore. So that can affect how much of the protein you have. And uh, then there's also all kinds of, uh, so yeah, post-transcription processing that of course also is splicing, but there's also other things that are being modified on the DNA, um, for which it may not matter what the codon looks like, but where you just have a certain motif, and if you change the sequence, if you change the nucleotide there, then that recognition may not work anymore. So there's actually many ways in which this can still have an effect. Um, it may be less common than you, when you have a non-synonymous SNP, but it's still very much possible. Okay, so these are both single nucleotide changes. Um, what do we have next? Structural variants. That's um, now again a different kind of uh, variation. Here we have more or less the same idea. It's insertions, deletions, inversions, but it's just on a larger scale. It's not just a few proteins. It's it's from a thousand to a million base pairs at once where this happens. Um, and the results can also be pretty much the same. If this happens in the middle of an exon, then you probably have a big issue. If it's an intron, maybe it doesn't change so much. Um, on top of that, you have copy number variations, um, which I will give an example in just a second. What this means is you have some sections which are being repeated a lot. And what is being repeated can vary in length. So it can be, for example, two nucleotides that repeat many, many times after. Or it can be hundreds of nucleotides that repeat many, many times after. And how many repeats you have tends to be important. And we will see an example of that uh, in just a second. Um, so that is the idea of copy number variation. Those are changes on, on a larger level, but what, what, how, what actually repeats um, can have varying lengths. Um, and then there's chromosomal rearrangements. Often there is no clear distinction between a structural variant or a chromosomal rearrangement. Um, here again the idea is to go to an even larger scale. Now we are looking at whole chromosomes. and. Um, the actual changes are the same idea, so you can delete this part of a chromosome, for example, then you're lacking lots of genes, for example, you can um, duplicate it, which can affect um, regulation if you suddenly have twice as much of the protein, if you don't regulate it in any different way, uh, that can be an issue. You can have inversions, which um, may or may not have a huge effect if most of the genes are not affected. Um, did I just no? So right. So um, this is insertion. You just move, you move uh, a part of the code from one chromosome to a different one, which can also be important if that chromosome is regulated in a certain way, but the other one isn't at this position, uh, or if the length of the of the if the size or the shape of the chromosome is important. Um, and then finally you have um, the idea of translocation, which this is really hard to see, but the idea here is that these two um, kind of swap places. So uh, on one end of the chromosome you now have a part that used to be here, and on this end of the chromosome you now have a part that used to be here. And while this is important, we will also get to it in a second. Um, yes, yeah, so let's first look at uh, I should have probably put this before I talked about structural variants. So this is a deletion of a single amino acid variant. Um, and yeah, it's <laughs> not much to say. It's a phenylalanine at position 508. You just delete it. Um, it doesn't change the coding, the, the, the coding frame. The rest of the protein is fine. It's being translated. Um, but you lack that one amino acid. And it just so happens that this amino acid is really important for the folding of the protein. So this is a transmembrane protein. It's um, being sent. It's, um, it's in the ER, and from the ER it should be sent to the cell membrane to do its job, which is um, regulate uh, the, the transport of chloride across the membrane. 
But because that one residue is missing, it actually doesn't even fold. It never gets out of the, of the endoplasmatic reticulum. And um, the result of that is the development of cystic fibrosis as a disease. Um, so just one, one amino acid missing can have a large effect already if it is important for the protein. Right, now back to the structural variants. Um, the first thing I mentioned is copy number variation. Uh, one example here is Huntington's disease. So we have this gene called Huntington, and it has um, this, <laughs> this glutamine repeat here. So this is the, the start of the actual sequence, and um, you, it has tons of glutamines here. And how many you have actually varies a lot in the population. So healthy individuals have something between 10 and 35. And that is fine. But if you have even more repeats, if you have more than 36, then you start developing Huntington's disease at some point in your life. So this disease has a relatively um, late onset. You only get this when you are um, 40 around. Um, but here actually how many of those you have matters. And Interestingly, the more you have, the earlier you get the disease. So uh, this is, it's not entirely clear how this works. Um, the protein also kind of starts aggregating in neurons and then the neurons die and that is not so good. Um, but how exactly it works, we don't know. But it's interesting that up to 35 you're relatively fine, but once you overdo it, um, you will you're get issues. <laughs> So uh, it's really just the, the amount of how often you repeat this glutamine which affects it. And by the way, this one here also differs apparently, but I'm not sure if this can cause anything if you have too many of those. Uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, so it's a really long protein actually. It's like it's uh, 3,000 residues long or so. It goes on a lot behind this, but this, uh, this thing at the start is, is, the, is what causes the disease. Uh, okay, and then... Uh, one thing for a huge change on the level of chromosomes, um, trisomy 21 you're probably aware of or also called Down syndrome. I talked about translocation, so there's different ways you can get this. One, uh, the, the, the problem is that there are three copies of chromosome 21 um, and that has a huge effect on the organism because it completely messes up regulation. You suddenly have like three copies of the gene and that this doesn't work at all. Um, most of these, so the, you can have trisomies on any chromosome, technically. This is just an error during, during um, cell division. And um, most uh, trisomies are, um, the, the, the rituals don't even get born because it has such a large effect. Uh, 21 is the one thing which is kind of tolerable, uh, apparently, in terms of regulation. Um, and yeah, so there's different ways of, of um, achieving this issue. Uh, one is just having three copies of 21. The other one I'm showing here is, and this gets back to translocation, you can have two normal copies of 21, but um, an error, a common error is that during translocation, part of the 21, um, of the 20, 20, 21st chromosome gets attached to the chromosome 14. And if this happens in the parent, that is not a huge issue. But if you then pass on this strand to the child, and the child also gets the 22 normal, the, the normal 21 chromosomes, then you suddenly have 21 plus a part of 21, and that is enough to, to mess up the regulation and um, lead to the disease. So that's how uh, translocation can be an issue, for example. Um, right. So these are all essentially effects that uh, lead to a disease. Uh, but that is not necessarily all kinds of uh, effect that a change can have. So that is the most severe one, but um, there's different levels of this. And um, I just wanna, want to highlight this that, this, that there are different kinds of effect that people speak about. Um, what we had, what we talked about the whole time essentially is up here, pathogenicity, something that, that leads to the development of a disease. Um, but um, when, when people talk of effects, some may also talk about something like um, 
up here, for you. so some of the tools we will talk about later actually try to predict this kind of effect, which um, is, is a smaller effect and um, which just measures um, the structure of the protein, how stable is it? Is it maybe a bit less stable than the native protein? It doesn't necessarily mean that it develops, that the whole disease develops out of it, but that is still an effect on the protein, so that may still be interesting to you. Or the molecular function, does the protein still do its function? Okay, but how efficiently does it do it? Is it a bit faster or a bit slower than the native, um, than the native, than the native protein, for example? So these are also effects that you can measure, and um, you could argue that these are kind of more direct effects. So this um, should be a bit easier to predict. This is why many, many people, first of all, just try to do this before they make the jump to a disease. Because to, to predict from, like, from just an input sequence and the variation on that sequence to predict that a disease will develop requires so many steps that you see, is the protein going to change, where is the protein involved, what could this cause, and so on. Um, predicting just that from sequence is a very, uh, very lofty goal. Um, so just predicting the change in the, the functional stability would be um, much more achievable. Um, yeah, so many, so all of the tools that I'm going to talk about essentially, well, some of them claim they go as far as predicting the disease relevance, but um, most, and also realistically, what, what most predict is more like down here. Just to make clear that there are different kinds and that what I just showed is not necessarily what these tools are now able to predict. Um, yeah, because now we're going to talk about a few methods that do this. And there's no way I'm going to finish in time. I thought this would be much faster, but okay. So the first tool is SIFT. Um, the um, original one was from 1995 or so, I believe. It's a very old tool. And um, the approach is really simple. It doesn't do any machine learning. Uh, it just essentially just checks how conserved are the residues in the protein. And uh, to do this, um, we have this nice flowchart here. So this is our input sequence. We use PsyBlast and find in some database um, homologous sequence to that input sequence, um, which we then have here. Then they build a multiple sequence alignment out of all of these um, similar sequences. And then they look in this multiple sequence alignment at every column, at every residue, how conserved is that residue? So do we, at this position, always have an arginine or whatever? And uh, if, the, if um, there is not a lot of variation in how many amino acids you see here, then apparently a change here would have an effect on the function. That's the basic idea, because um, the, the amino acid is evidently conserved among all proteins that do the same or similar functions. While for um, other positions, such as here, um, it doesn't even appear in some of the proteins and where it does, it can kind of doesn't matter what the amino acid is apparently. So here changes would be more tolerated. Um, yeah, and that's the, that's the idea. From that they, they calculate the scaled probability, a measure of how much does every position, um, how much variance does every position have. Now, do you see any problem up until this point that could occur? What is the, what has to be right for this whole thing to work? Or oh, what's, the, what's the baseline that everything is based on? The length of the sequence? Mm, maybe the length? Well, not, not why, why the length, I don't know. <laughs> In order to align them. Okay, align them is, is one important point. So the alignment has to be right, of course. Um, Let's assume they are similar enough that the alignment works. But then it's still important what the input to that alignment is. So the example the authors actually give in the, in the paper is uh, for viruses, for example. We have tons of sequences because there's many different strains and they are relatively easy to sequence. So if you take such a protein and you look for similar proteins, 
in the database, what you get is the best hit, right? And the best hit for such a protein may be a sequence that is like 99% the same. So then your whole multiple sequence alignment can consist of sequences that are extremely similar. And that will then look to the algorithm like every position is super conserved and important, right? But that's just because the input to your alignment isn't even diverse enough. So that is an issue that they have to account for. Hello. Ah. <laughs> um, exactly, so too many similar hits from Cyblast. And to counter this, they have this additional value, the conservation value. And um, that is essentially a confidence measure and right, so what, what they do is they just look at every position, how many amino acids do I even see of the 20? And if I see just one of them, the idea is that um, you kind of write down your prediction. So if like really in every sequence you have just one of them, you are, can't be entirely sure that this is um, actually highly conserved or if it's just a problem of your input. Um, that, that's the idea. So Is that, yeah? Once again, the basic idea of SIFT, SIRT, PSI, <coughs> PSI, similar uh, proteins or sequences, mm -hmm. and then use those similar sequences and the, the search, the query sequence, mm -hmm. and do the multiple alignment, and then search for the highly conserved. So, so just the basic yeah. setting. Yeah, 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 absolutely right. That, that's all it is. And then you just, you know, how, how many amino acids do I see? How often do I see which one? And from that you infer, okay, 90% of the time I see arginine. Probably this is really important that at this position this is arginine. And if I see, for example, all 20 amino acids equally distributed, then probably it doesn't really matter what's at this position. And then you have an input variant and you just check against this. Is this something that that seems uh, tolerable, or is it something that goes into into a into a residue where apparently I'm not allowed to have a whole lot of variation? That's all there is to it. Yeah, and then so the, the cutoff is just empirically determined. If if the score is like 0 0.05, I believe, if it's smaller than that, then it's um, uh, assume to be having an assume to have an effect, and if not, then not. But that that's just how they match the numbers. The, the, what you described is exactly right for the basic idea. Okay, um, a kind of extension of that idea is Provian, which is a much newer method now. Uh, again, it is uh, the basic idea is to look at the conservation. Um, what they do differently here is you have a set of sequences here which are your similar sequences, the same ones we collected before essentially. Um, and before we build one big multiple sequence alignment out of all of them. What they do here instead now is first of all they cluster them. So they use uh, CD hit, again our clustering algorithm at 80% uh, six, sequence identity. And then they get clusters of sequences that are more similar than 80% sequence identity, essentially, um, which are these clusters here. Um, and then they have some number n. They take the, the, the top n clusters, I believe the top 45 clusters, which are most similar to, to our query sequence, and then for every sequence in that cluster, so say for example we look now at, so here it's the top three clusters in this example, um, just for simplicity. Now they take cluster one and in cluster one you have sequence one, six and seven and for each of those sequences they look how similar is that sequence to our query sequence um, and that gives you a certain score, um, minus four, minus seven, minus seven in this case. And you do that for all sequences in that cluster. And then you average all of these scores and you get one similarity score for that cluster. And then you do the same thing for other clusters as well. Then you have the average scores for all clusters. And then you average over those again. And um, what you find that is your final score. Now what's different here to uh, SIFT is that um, 
So, okay, so the similar I didn't mention this, the similarity here, this is calculated via the Blossom matrix, um, but I'm not, that's not really the important point here. Um, they, the big difference to SIFT is that you average, that you treat the clusters um, equally. So you are now not biased anymore by, um, by how many extremely similar sequences you have in your, in your set of uh, all sequences, essentially. If you have, um, for example, the case that you have one sequence that is similar and that happens to be really common, where you have like a thousand hits for that one sequence, and then you have more similar sequences, but they appear just 10 times and 20 times in your, in your database. Then you have like 1,030 sequences in your total set. And SIFT would look at all of them together, and the 1,000 sequences would, have, would weigh much more, of course, because there's more of them. And um, SIFT just counts how often something occurs. Provian, by doing this clustering step first, puts all of those 1,000 in one cluster, the 10 in one cluster, and the 20 in one cluster. And then it weights the clusters equally, because we just do the average of every cluster. This isn't the weighted average, this is just the average. So if these were the 1,000 sequences, they count as much as the 10 and the 20. And this way you get a more balanced output. That's the, that's the whole idea, that you counter this, um, that you counter highly, highly similar input sequences. Um, yeah, and then same thing, you have a final score, you have some threshold they determined, and that predicts if your input, if, you, if your input vari variant is, um, is, uh, has an effect or not. So of course you, you look at the, if the effect variant here, I didn't say this, but um, you look at your query sequence with the effect variant in it, not the normal query. But is that here? The, the main point is that you do this clustering and then each cluster is treated equally. Okay. Polyfen is another um, very popular method that you should have heard of. Um, this is Polyfen 2. Um, the basic idea is the same. You have a set of similar sequences. You build a multiple sequence alignment out of it. What Polyfen does is that this is now actually um, a machine learner, so um, it uses the multiple sequence alignment, it uh, extracts out of that several features, um, such as, uh, yeah, so several scores on the identity, on how conserved certain residues are, um, how many, yeah, how many CG, um, doesn't matter. <laughs> the thing is, it, it extracts a lot more features from the multiple sequence alignment. It does the same thing based on structure, so actually determine protein structures. If they are available for your input query, it uses the structure as well. And it ex extracts features from there, for example, how is a certain residue on the surface, how accessible is it, is it hydrophobic, and so on. Um, and then it puts all of that into a, a naive base classifier and then calculates your final prediction score. Um, and also, uh, independent of that, it looks up if, and this is generally actually a, a good idea, it just looks what kind of annotations do we already have for the input um, sequence. So uh, in Swissprot, for that protein or even for that variant, do we already know that do we know something about this variant already, what it could do? Um, and it, it takes all of that into account and then predicts the final effect. Uh, okay, and then the, the almost final one is CAD. Um, CAD is a very new method um, published last year and um, the idea is that uh, it has a set of 63 features um, which it extracts from your input sequence and they again include conservation, so conservation is always an important feature of course. Um, 
It also includes regulatory information. For example, do we know that a certain residue is binding a transcription factor? Or do we know that this is an exon or an intron? Or um, also what do SIFT and polyphen predict? Because, <laughs> yeah, why not? So, because the difference here is that this is not just on the protein level, this uh, works on the DNA level. So, um, to talk about exons, introns, and transcription factor binding, this is not something you can do. And on the amino acid sequence, they are actually able to score variants on the DNA level, and because of that also, um, essentially have access to more to more information um, and if it is if 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 it does code for a protein then then they also um, let sift and polyphen run and take that as an input feature and the whole thing is then put into a support vector machine um, and they trained that classifier to predict um, yeah to predict the effect or not effect of a certain variant uh, to do that, you need a training set, and um, <clears throat> in this case, um, it may not be entirely clear how you could get that training set. So what you would need is a set of variants where you know they have an effect, and a set of variants where you know they don't have an effect. And this is not available, at least not at a large scale, and especially not on the DNA level. So the hack they did here um, is, They take for the neutral set, they look at a, at a common ancestor between human and chimps. And then they just look what differs between us currently and that common ancestor and what appears uh, in, in a lot of the human population right now. So changes <coughs> that, that, that happen and um, that are different but uh, since they are around, they must apparently be neutral because, you know, it's, it's, um, it's common in the population, so uh, it cannot really have an effect. That's the assumption. So that gives you a large set of neutral variants. And then uh, the idea for deleterious variants is just you just simulate variants that are not these. And anything that we don't see then apparently is deleterious because it's being removed by evolution. Uh, and that gives you two very large sets of neutral and um, deleterious variants and then this is what they trained on. Uh, that's the idea behind CAT. Okay, and the final method is SNAP. SNAP is uh, from our from Rust lab, um, which is why we will spend a bit more time on that. And I'm now going to use some of Burkhardt's slides. So, <laughs> um, Burkhardt always likes to point out the people behind the methods. Um, in this case, SNAP was developed by Jana Bromberg. Uh, this is Jana. This is Burkhardt, I guess. I <laughs> I've never seen this before either. Um, remember the slide we saw before of the different types of effect that variants can have? The idea behind SNAP was to kind of integrate all of these kinds of effect into one predictor. So this is a large phenotypic change is, um, and this is supposed to present just a molecular function change, a change in the binding energy um, and I don't know what these are supposed to represent. But the idea is all of these kinds of effect and um, there was a database where um, variants were catalogued to and where these kinds of effects could have could be retrieved. The, very, the database is called the Protein Mutant Database, or PMD. Um, yeah, this is what the entry looks like. So there's a protein reference here, and then here is um, what's actually changing. And um, yeah, she just extracted a set of variants from the database. And why is it so laggy? And the result is uh, this. So we have 40k effect variants, and we have 15k neutral variants. Um, so, first question is, is that, do we expect that? No. Why? Because in the beginning we saw that it should be vice versa. Um, uh, well, what did you see in the beginning? 
the beginning you said that that uh, around 67 percent of protein uh -huh. um, is, is unimportant to the to the function, and, and only 33 percent are actually required to determine the function. So uh, here we mm -hmm. see that it's quite the opposite. Mm, yes, that's a fair point. Uh, so why? Why does it look like that? No, to torment the developer. Uh, yeah, general question. So you have a database that collects. Let's say a database. They do their best. Yeah, they look at all the papers that are out there. They collect all the variants where they can find information on the neutral ones, the effect ones. Fine. They take all they can find. They find more effect, apparently. And there's a bias in the database because bias is always a good password to use. <laughs> <laughs> bias is the correct password to say. Yes, there is a bias in the database <laughs> towards the. When I say bias. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, but just bias is not going to give you points in the exam. <laughs> okay. uh, well, depends on the situation, maybe. But so so it's biased. But why is it biased? Um, this is a more 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 general question. Why do we have more effect variants found? published the neutral variants. Because neutral variants are not very interesting. Exactly, because they're boring, because we care about what has an effect, because it's much easier to predict this variant has an effect than to say, oh, this variant doesn't have an effect. Cool, right? <laughs> People don't really care about this. It's much harder to predict negative data. And it's also a bit harder to prove it in a way, because you can, you can see that something has an effect. But if you see that something doesn't have an effect, you can always say, well, maybe not in my experimental design. Maybe I have to do this test and this test. Does it really, under no circumstances, not have an effect? Neutral is also much harder to prove. So this is not what we expect the real distribution to be like, but it's what we have, unfortunately. Um, and I'm not, do I have more? Oh, yeah. So, okay, so this is what we have. There's nothing we um, can directly do about this. Is that <coughs> a problem now if we want to develop a machine learning predictor on this? Why? Just yes, <laughs> not enough. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, yes, why? <laughs> Potentially. We have until 15 minutes left, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the issue is that if you're not careful, your machine learning model will learn this distribution. Um, it will believe that this is reality. If you give it something uh, that it hasn't seen before, so if, if you then use it afterwards, after training, to predict, um, there will be a tendency to reiterate what it has learned. The, the results will tend to look like this, with a lot more effect than neutral. But we know that this is not reality, so we don't really want this. <coughs> and um, there's many things you could do about this, but ideally we would want more data, of course, more egg, and so we can, we can do fancy machine learning, we can show it these ones during training more often than these ones, and all of that kind of stuff, kind of try to balance the data set. But <clears throat> we want ideally more data, more actual and neutral variants. Now PMD doesn't have more, but we can think of other ways to get more. Um, yes, how to include, was I actually going to ask that? Yes, <laughs> so any ideas? How can we get more neutral variants? Relatively or absolute, absolute number? Uh, well, if you get more absolutely, you also get more. Uh, what are you going to do? Throw out the effect ones? Yeah. That's <laughs> that is something you can do. Fair point. That would train it more balanced, but then you threw away data. You don't want to do that usually. <laughs> I mean, you know these are effect variants. They're experimentally proven. This is good stuff. You, you, I. <laughs> um. Let's say we want to absolutely increase the neutral variants. Um, give an incentive to researchers <laughs> to increase the 
That's a good idea, um, but it will take a long time to have effect. Yeah. We, we don't have that much time, unfortunately. We want to train now with what we already have out there. Um, we have to create ourselves neutral variants somehow. Um, well, we could just um, make up some variants and see what happens. See what happens in one way. Like, make up any variants, put them in the training, and then what? I, I am not quite certain where I go from this, but... <laughs> I mean, you can just make up variants. Um, yes. You can make up nonsense variants and you just uh, move, them, remove them from your set. Uh, but I'm, I'm certain that you can, can somehow make neutral variants. So, so, okay, so you're saying you make up variants and you assign them their neutral. Just you, you guess their neutral. And um, you add them to the training. Yeah. You could actually do that. <laughs> I mean, maybe it helps. But then you have to make sure that when you do report your performance, you only report it on the ones where you have experimental validation. <laughs> so you can train on whatever you want, but you got to make sure you take them out again before you report your, your performance. Apart from that, I mean, if it works, that's a viable idea. <laughs> um, you just got to make sure what your, what your cross-validation performance will be. Yeah, but I mean, there's no, no other uh, alternative because you can't get real data, apparently, because it takes time. Yeah. So you have to make something up? Yeah, so there is, it is a hack, definitely. Um, the approach they took here is um, they looked at enzymes. Enzymes are categorized by EC numbers, um, enzyme classification number, I believe that means. They have four tiers. Uh, so for example, this here is an enzyme classification number, um, and that defines the function of that enzyme. Um, the Higher level is a relatively general description of what the enzyme does, hydrolase, and then um, the further down you get, the more you learn what exactly the protein does. So um, the PTB phosphatase here is the most, is the actual function of the enzyme, you would say. That's the most, um, the most specific description of the function that you can get. Uh, and now you have a set of proteins where you know what their C number is, where it was experimentally determined that they have this function. So what you do now is you take two proteins which have the same EC number. You assume they have the same function. And uh, you take some that are similar enough, or you know they have the same function. Uh, you take some that are similar enough that you can easily make an alignment and can assume that your alignment is correct. And then you have these two proteins aligned. And then you look at the differences between them. And apparently, the residues that differ here don't matter for function, right? You could argue that. So these are neutral variants, in a way. And by doing this hack, they get 25k additional neutral variants. And they were then added to the whole set, and that actually balances it out pretty well. So now we have 40k of both, essentially using the PND and the neutral ones from EC we just created. Right, so uh, SNAP then is, is a neural network, an artificial neural network based predictor. It has a set of input features, biophysical features, again conservation here in the in the form of alignment profiles is of course an input feature because conservation is always important. And um, then several other ones, secondary structure, solvent accessibility, residue flexibility, um, all of that, and that's a distinction to polyphen, all of that is uh, predicted, secondary structure, flexibility, and so on. So these are prediction methods which predict this from sequence. Um, that means all we need as an input is still only a sequence. We don't need a structure as well to get these kind of features. Um, all of that is determined solely from sequence, put into a neural network, and then we train the method. Additionally, there's also a version of SNAP called SNAP annotated, which has a similar idea to what I said um, about polyphen. So it also looks, what do we already know? Are there any motifs annotated in that sequence? Do we have any binding sites known or anything like that? And DTEC also takes that into account for the prediction. Um, yes, as I said, so SNAP is a neural network. Here we have all of the features. They are encoded into our um, input nodes. Then we have a hidden layer. This is not to size. There are more nodes than just these few. Um, but we do have two output nodes. 
one output node um, which which gives us um, which is optimized for um, effect variance. So this should give a high value when we have, when we believe a variant has an effect, and one output node which um, is the reverse for the neutral variance. So. Uh, the total score is then normalized between minus 100 and 100. Minus 100 means uh, the predictor is, uh, is, is relatively, is very sure that this is a neutral variant. And 100 means it's very sure that it's an effect variant. And uh, the zero in between is kind of, we don't know really what it is. Okay, and since we have these two output nodes, what we can do is we can look at what are the actual um, floating point outputs from these nodes. So uh, we have two variants for which we predict here, um, for which we predict here, one and two. And for one, the output node's values are 0 0.8 and 0 0.2. So here, um, let's say this was effect, I'm not sure, it doesn't matter. Uh, here we are relatively sure that this is effect. While for the other one, we have 0 0.51 and 0 0.49. So both of these will be predicted as effect because this value is higher than the values down here. But here, you, you, we can see that apparently this is, uh, the, the predictor is more sure here about his prediction than he is uh, over here. And this difference between, this differential between the output nodes is then used <laughs> later on. <laughs> Let's first of all look at the performance. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, uh, right. Snap's performance. Um, the main point I'm showing this slide is to talk about the Q2 again because that value always comes up. Q2 is um, a two-state accuracy and all that means is you take all the cases that you predicted correctly and you divide it by your whole training set. So all effect variants that you predicted as effect variants plus all neutral variants that you predicted as neutral variants divided by all variants that you put into the predictor. That's the Q2. Uh, two because neutral and effect. If you have, for example, a secondary structure prediction, you often talk about Q3 because you have three classes which you are trying to predict, helix, sheet, and loop. Um, but the idea is the same. All correct ones divided by all ones. Uh, yeah, and SNAP performed fairly well in Q2. Uh, in particular, the, the version taking into account already known um, annotations performs even better. So that's good. Um, now we get back to the reliability index. Um, this is a cumulative curve. Uh, and that means if we look, so we have points for, um, for effect variance, we have points for neutral variance separately. And if we look, for example, at a reliability index of uh, one or larger, so that down here we see how much of the total set of variance we are looking at. Reliability index of one or larger means um, the majority of our set. So, um, uh, uh, one being not a high reliability. So we start at zero, that's the lowest rea reliability, and then we go up to nine. Uh, so if we take all of one or larger, we are taking most of our data set we are looking at, and we just look at this subset how many, what is our accuracy on that subset? And in this case, that's something like 79% or so um, for the effect variance. And it's around 84% for the neutral variance. Um, and then, as you can see, if you go to stricter reliability index cutoffs, for example, I'm just waving around, there's nothing. <laughs> um, if you go, for example, only to those that have a reliability index of six or larger, you can see that the performance of this subset is increased. So that is relatively straightforward, that, uh, or at least that is what you would hope you see if your predictor actually learns something. Um, but having something like this is important for your end user because if you they probably don't look at thousands or ten thousands of variants. They have like one variant. They have one output and a score. And they want to know how reliable is that score. Um, is it like is it up here? Can I expect this kind of accuracy, or is it somewhere down here? And um, the, as I said before, the way Snap does is it just looks at the differential between the two output nodes to give um, some kind of indication of how 
how correct the output probably is. Uh, yeah, one more thing. So PMD categorizes variants by how, by uh, whether the effect is um, not just neutral or effect, but also like on uh, on a scale in between, like how strong is the effect. Um, and here, there's um, they took uh, three of these classes, and what you can see is that. Um, uh, the the variants that are neutral are kind of cluster around here at the neutral side around minus 100. The effect variants kind of cluster up here, um, and then the the ones in between are actually in between. So um, essentially, what you see is that the strength of the effect kind of correlates with the output score from SNAP. So not only does it predict effect or neutral, it also essentially sees a certain signal. Um, of how strong is the effect of a variant, and the stronger the effect, the higher the score tends to be. Um, yes, this is again uh, the performance of SNAP now compared to other methods. And these are SIFT, and this is Polyphen 1, which is more simple than what I presented, um, but the idea is the same. And you can see SNAP is better than these two, kind of, but not that much. And given that SNAP has a relatively much more complicated approach, um, this is um, maybe not what you would want to see. So ideally, you would hope for a bigger difference here. Um, so what they did then is they said, OK, all the variants where SIFT and Polyphen predict the same thing are probably easy. Because they agree, and that you could argue that this makes them easier to predict. So they looked at all variants where SIFT and Polyphen don't agree, and this is the result for only those variants. Um, now, first of all, what you can see, there is a random the estimate of what a random predictor would be, uh, what, what the performance of a random predictor would be. Um, and you can see that SIFT and Polyphen are now actually worse than the random predictor. That is being unfair, because we took out exactly those variants which we believe were easy for them. So. You can make it so you shouldn't see this as, oh, they are terrible now. Um, but what you can see is that SNAP actually for those is significantly better. So the argument here is that SNAP um, actually for cases which are not easy to predict tends to perform better than SIFT and Polyphen. And that is a better cell than this. That's the point. So um, try to find interesting things about your method, not just the, the obvious in comparison. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if we have. Yeah, I can I can do snap two and then we have to stop. So uh, that was snap one. Uh, then Max came along and wanted to improve snap, and the, the result is snap two. Uh, the data set same idea. We have the variants from the protein database. We have the variants um, from the enzymes, neutral variants we created. And on top of that, <coughs> he used what's new now, disease variants. So he looked at OMIM, that's the database of uh, Mendelian diseases and variants that cause these diseases. And he just added those variants as well. So um, high effect variants, you could say, because um, they, they, it's a single variant that causes a disease. Um, they are now also part of the data set. Uh, he very much increased the uh, set of input features. The idea is still the same though, so this is all things you can um, you can calculate from the sequence. Uh, it's just different prediction methods and um, indices, annotations of amino acids, um, how they tend, how strong they tend to bind, and all of this you put in. Um, but the basic idea is the same. It's a neural network. It has all of these input features. And additionally, he created a version that do, does not use alignment input, so that doesn't use conservation as an input. Now, I've said before many times, conservation is very often your strongest feature. Why would you not, why would you have a version that doesn't use the one feature that you believe is best or very strong? Because of the bias we talked about earlier? You take the similar sequence aligned and then, of course, a lot of them seem to be highly conserved. Mm, yes, could be a point. Yeah, but yeah, okay. But there's more. Let's say we, we mostly trust this. I mean, it is an input feature. Um, we believe it tells us something valuable. 
then it's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be the kind of method you if would you usually really use. Then it is a good feature, yes. and you leave it out, then it makes no sense for me right now. So, <laughs> the, generally, you wouldn't use this kind of version. You're absolutely right. Um, nonetheless, it's interesting to create it on the one hand um, because it tells you how important your feature actually is in a way. So, you take it out, you see how, how much worse does it perform. It gives you an idea of how important conservation really is for your method. And you could also argue um, that uh, it's, it's like, so that's essentially what it's being used for. It's like a fallback mode. If, uh, if Everything else you can create from the sequence. And usually you don't have any issues in creating a decent alignment. But if you do actually have a sequence where you cannot really get a good alignment as an input, and that does happen, um, although not very often, but it does happen, and then you have a predictor that expects an alignment as an input. Now, first of all, just technically, um, let's say we somehow still make it work, like we give it some terrible alignment as an input or something. Let's say our neural network expects an input, so we have to give it something. But then you have a, a method that is trained on expecting this alignment input. It's a very strong feature, in fact, but it doesn't get it. That can be an issue, because uh, this, this really strong feature is now not there or really terrible, and that is going to affect your prediction performance. So if then you have this kind of fallback mode, you can use a predictor that is probably a lot worse, but at least that is consistently worse, if you will. That, that does not use, that is, that is an important difference because you know what to expect from this because it, doesn't, because it doesn't require you to have the alignment. You know it's worse, but you know where it is worse. It's not some undefined thing that now um, gives you some kind of performance. And this is, um, so this is, these are the results. Um, snap here in Cyan. And in dark blue is snap2, so snap2 is always better than snap, that's good as a start. Uh, it's also better than sift, which is also nice. And the black curve here is um, the snap without alignment input, and you can see it's much worse, clearly. But uh, it is still better than the estimate for random here in pink. Um, if it were worse, then there really is no point in this method, but it is still better than random, so that's a start. Um, and yeah, we, we just know now, if we use this method, this is around the performance we can expect from it. Uh, again, same idea as before, um, looking only at variants where the other methods don't agree, which are apparently not that easy to predict. Again, SNAP2 tends to perform pretty well here. Before, Polyphen um, dropped a lot in this comparison. This is now Polyphen2, which is better, which is apparently also more stable, um, so it's now Clearly better than random, but still um, snap is the best method here, so it does really well, really well on <laughs> on difficult variants. Uh, and then this is what I mentioned before. So they try to make an argument for this no alignment mode. There are a few orphans, um, so variants for which we can't really get an alignment input. Um, and snap is better here <laughs> by one percentage point. Uh, on just eight proteins and 20, 248 variants, so you can't really make a point out of this. This is too small of a data set to really say this works, but this is the idea. For variants like this, we have uh, the fallback mode in SNAP2. Uh, yeah, and the application we're not going to do because we're over time. So, any questions? No? If not, thank you very much.